we have to grant goodness and wisdom to god or we have no place to go no rock to stand on no way to do any thinking or reasoning or believing we must believe in the goodness and in the wisdom of god or we betray that in us which differentiates us from the beasts the image of god himself so we begin with the assumption not a guess not a hope but a knowledge that god is wise but someone will ask if god is good and wise how do you explain polio prison camps mass executions wars and all the other evils that are in the world many people lie in a bed of suffering or go about with one leg or are deaf or blind and if god is good and wise says the critic then will you explain how this could be let me answer by an allegory let us say that a man is very very wise and is not only wise but is rich to the point of having all the money in the world and let us suppose he decides to build the most beautiful palace that has ever been built in the world so in some little country say in europe he gathers together the finest artists and architects the finest designers that can be found anywhere he combs the nations of the world and buys the top brains and the top talent of the world and brings them there then he says i have billions of dollars to put at your disposal money is no object i want the most beautiful building in all the world i want its floors to be gold i want its walls to be jasper i want its appointments to be carved ivory i want it to be studded with diamonds and rubies i want it to be the epitome of all that is beautiful all that is gracious all that genius can create when it is finished i want it to be the talk of all the world i want everyone everywhere from broadway to piccadilly circus to the jungles of africa and borneo to talk about that palace now go to work and give me the best that you can give and pooling their wisdom and genius they built the most beautiful building a building that makes the taj mahal look like a barn it was beyond all possible beauty this palace well then let us suppose that after a year or so the political fortunes change and a conquering army comes in and takes over that little country the soldiers come in and take over the palace great tough barbarian soldiers with hobnailed boots they care nothing about beauty about art about the diamonds and gold let us suppose that they stable their horses in the palace that they spit on the floor and throw beer cans all over the place and make a wallow out of it eventually the beautiful palace is filled with dirt old rags and filth of every kind the man who owns it and the artists who built it have fled into exile while the heel of the barbarian treads down the little country one passerby whispers to another there's the great palace the greatest concentration of universal beauty known in the world and the other person says why oh, it doesn't look like it to me or smell like it it's a pig pen how can you say it's beautiful just wait for a while the first passerby replies there's been a war and this is an occupied country the fortunes of war will change again and the oppressor will be driven out and let us suppose that these bestial and brutal men are driven out then the rich man comes back from some faraway retreat and says to his artists architects and sculptors let's get to work and clean this up we will begin at the bottom and work to the top and put it back into shape again after a year or so of work the palace stands once again shining in the noonday sun the epitome of all beauty and the essence of all that man can possibly do and once again all around the world newspaper tv and radio reporters talk about it it is seen once more as the most beautiful thing in the world once there was someone named god god the father almighty maker of heaven and earth he turned his mighty wisdom loose on the making of man he said let us make man in our image genesis chapter 1 verse 26 then he made a garden eastward in eden and he put man in it he said to man i will make him a help meet for him chapter 2 verse 18 he put man asleep and from his side he took a rib and made a woman and said this will be your mate your wife and he called her name eve then satan came into the garden and wound himself about the limbs of the tree of life he began to whisper insinuations against god and then the fortunes of moral war changed satan took over and man sinned betraying the god who had made him 
that which used to be the most beautiful of all gardens and most lovely of all worlds, populated by the most radiant of all creatures, made in the image of God, now is turned into a pig-pen and plunged into darkness. And so the critic walks about as the passer-by did by the palace, and he says, Are you telling me that a wise God made this pig-pen? But I say, Wait just a minute. God in his great wisdom and in his providential dealings with this world has allowed foreign soldiers to occupy. And this epitome of all beauty, this flying ball we call the earth, this glorious home of the creature made in the image of God, is now under a cloud, a shadow. It tells us in Romans chapter 8, verses 19 through 22, For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. God's wise plans will be carried out. But God in his wisdom has allowed for a little time this foreign occupation. The world we live in with its cyclones, tornadoes, tempests, tidal waves, and other forces of destruction is under occupation. The soldiers of the devil march up and down in it with their hobnailed boots, their ignorance, and their lack of appreciation. They catch God's beauty and destroy it. The state of Pennsylvania, where I was born, has rolling hills, flashing streams, waterfalls, meadows, and lovely forests. If you have ever driven through it, you know how beautiful it is. Near where I lived when I was a boy, money-loving men have done what they call strip mining. Instead of digging into the hill to get the coal, they strip the top off and get the coal from above. And the result looks as though nature were weeping, as though the whole world were a graveyard. I have seen thousands of acres of the lovely hillsides, green and beautiful, that I knew as a boy, lying wounded and bleeding. They have used the bulldozer, the plow, and other great instruments to tear nature apart, just to get at a little bit of her treasure and make a little more money, just so they can have a bigger swimming pool and a larger yacht. But do you think that God Almighty has surrendered and gone away forever? No. God says I'm running creation, even though it is groaning under the plow and the bulldozer, under the heel of the foe. And one of these days the great God Almighty is going to send his Son from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16-17 through 17. We will be changed, raised, glorified, and made into the image of God. He's going to clean house down here, and there shall be peace from the river to the ends of the earth. Where the dragon lay, there shall be roses blooming, and the fruit of paradise. Then we'll see that God was wise. But we're going to have to be patient and go along with God for a little while, because we're under occupation. Wisdom Defined What is wisdom? It is the skill to achieve the most perfect ends by the most perfect means. Both the means and the ends have to be worthy of God. Wisdom is the ability to see the end from the beginning, to see everything in proper relation and in full focus. It is to judge in view of final and ultimate ends and to work toward those ends with flawless precision. God Almighty must be flawlessly precise. God doesn't bumble. The British used to say of themselves, We muddled through, meaning they got through somehow, playing it by ear, hoping for the best, and taking advantage of situations. They've done it well for the last thousand years. That's the way we have to do it. But God never works that way. If God worked that way, it would prove that God didn't know any more than we did about things. But God works with flawless precision because God sees the end from the beginning, and he never needs to back up. Did you ever notice that our Lord Jesus Christ, when he walked the earth, never apologized? He never got up in the morning and said, I'm sorry, boys, yesterday when I was talking I misspoke myself and I said this, but I meant that. 
never. Because he was wisdom divinely incarnated in the voice of a man. And when he spoke, he said it right the first time. He never had to apologize. I've had to get up and explain myself a few times. I've even had to get up publicly and tell the people I've made a donkey of myself a few times. I'm just a man, you know. But Jesus Christ never once said, I'm sorry, but I said the wrong thing yesterday. I didn't mean to leave that impression. He always said it right because he was God. He never apologized, never explained. He said, this is the way it is, and they either got it or they didn't. And if they didn't get it, he told them a little more. But he never backed out on anything that he said because he is God. Wisdom in the Bible is different from wisdom on earth, in that Bible wisdom has a moral connotation. It is high and holy, full of love and purity. The idea of shrewdness or cunning is never found in Scripture except when attributed to Satan or evil men. But wisdom, when attributed to God, to good men, or to angels, always means the skill to achieve on a high, pure, loving level. There is never any shrewdness or craftiness in it. God's wisdom is infinite. Because God is wise, He has to be all-wise. He couldn't be a little bit wise. If I thought that God were only a little bit wise, or even ninety percent wise, I'd never get to sleep tonight. If I were to listen to the ten o'clock news and hear what they're doing in the Congo and in Laos, if I heard that enemy soldiers had broken through the lines, if I knew those things and believed that God were only partly right, I'd never be able to sleep. I'd worry myself into a state of shock. But I believe that God is infinitely wise, altogether discreet. The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth, by understanding hath he established the heavens. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 19. We don't have to worry about it because God is wise, infinitely wise. The wisdom of God is seen in His creation and in His redemption, in that God has planned the highest good for the highest number for the longest time. I hate the word opportunist. I don't hate people. I hate things. I don't hate a cringing, palm-licking, opportunistic preacher. I couldn't hate him and be a Christian. But I hate the cringing, crawling, slimy way he lives. And I don't like opportunism because it's an attitude that doesn't think about next year, let alone eternity. It's only about the next time, the next time they send in a report to headquarters or the next time they're called somewhere else. Opportunists work only for the time being. God, on the other hand, always thinks of the highest good for the greatest number for the longest time. God always thinks in terms of eternity. When God plans to bless a man, he takes that poor little time-cursed creature in his hand and says, My son, I breathe into you eternity and immortality. I let you share in my endlessness. If you really knew how long you were privileged to live and to be with God, you would rejoice. God Almighty has planned that you shall not only enjoy Him now, but for all the eternities to come. And it's for the greatest number and the highest good. Sometimes churches and governing boards do things to get a little more money or a few more members, but it's not for the highest good of the people. Every church should be run for the highest good of the greatest number of people, even if it appears to flop. That's the way God has planned it. God's Wisdom Revealed As we look at where the wisdom of God is revealed, remember that allegory of the beautiful palace. Remember that it can be disputed by unbelieving men. They will walk by the beautiful palace that now is a pig pen and say, You can't prove to me that the God who made this is wise and good. There's too much pain, crime, sin, and filth. I repeat, God Almighty is running His world. The day will come when God will lift a cloud off the world and they shall gather in admiration from everywhere and say how wonderful God is. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. 
Thou art worthy, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, chapter 5, verses 9 through 10 and 12. And we shall be admired, and God shall be admired in us. Notice that when God did his most awful, majestic works, he always did them in the darkness. In the creation, you may remember that it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Back there in the darkness, God was doing some wonderful, awful, terrible, glorious things. As much as to say, I don't even want the angels, seraphim, or archangels to see what I'm doing. And when God incarnated his Son, bringing him into the world as a man, he did not send him down out of heaven, shining like a meteor to startle the world. He formed him in the sweet darkness of the virgin's womb unseen by mortal eye. The bones were formed in the womb of her that was with child. It was as if God were saying, In my infinite wisdom I am incarnating my eternal word in the form of a man, and no one will see my mystery. And they never did. And when he was nailed on the cross, hanging there, twisting and writhing in death for you and me, darkness settled down on the earth like a cloud upon him, as though God were saying, You can't see him. I won't even let you see him die. I'm doing my wonders of the atonement in the darkness. And when the atonement was done and he said, It is finished, John chapter 19, verse 30, God lifted the night, and they took him down and put him away in the tomb. And when they came to see him rise, he was already risen. They came a long while before day, when it was still dark, but he was not there. He was risen. Every great thing that God has done, He has done in the silence and the darkness, because His wisdom is such that no man could understand it anyhow. In redemption, Christ was crucified. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24, chapter 2, verse 7. In salvation, God requires us to repent and believe. This is done by the wise counsel of God. For after that in the wisdom of God the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Chapter 1, verse 21. And in the consummation we also see God's wisdom, to the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10. So in all of this, the all-wise wisdom of God is being revealed. The crux of your life lies right there. It doesn't matter whether you know this little wisp of systematic theology or not. That isn't the point. The point is that it's either got to be God's wisdom or yours. It's either God's way or yours. All that you and I have lived for, hoped for, and dreamed over in our heart of hearts, life, safety, happiness, heaven, immortality, the presence of God, hinges on whether you're going to accept the ultimate wisdom of the triune God as revealed in the Scriptures and in His providential working in mankind. Or are you going to go your own way? The most perfect definition of sin that I know of is given by Isaiah in chapter 53, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. Turning to our own way is the essence of sin. I turn to my way because I think it is wiser than God's way. God may say to some businessman, Tithe your income this year. The businessman says, Oh, God, I can't do it. 
God says, tithe it, son. And he says, I can't do it, because if I do, I won't be able to pay my taxes. God says, tithe it, son. But he still says, I can't do it, God, and he doesn't. And the next year he doesn't make as much, and his business peters out. Why? Because he's not obeying God. A starry-eyed young lady looks at that big fellow that she loves and wants so much, but he's a sinner and has no intention of being anything else but a sinner, while she's a born-again Christian. So she throws herself down on her knees before God and cries, Oh, God, what shall I do? The voice within her says, You know what you need to do. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 But she leaps to her feet and says, No, God, I can't pay that price. It's too much. So she compromises. She takes her wisdom against God's wisdom and marries the guy. Then he refuses to go to church at all and makes her life a hell from that hour on. Five years and two or three children later, her husband has left her. She comes to her pastor with a broken heart and says, Pastor, what can I do? Being a decent pastor and not wanting to hurt her feelings, he doesn't remind her that back when the wisdom of God said, Don't marry him, she said, I know better than you, God. This is the crux of our life. This is the difference between revival and a dead church. This is the difference between a spirit-filled life and a self-filled life. Who's running it? Who's the boss? Whose wisdom is prevailing, the wisdom of God or the wisdom of man? In all the providential dealings of God with me, I must take my stand and decide that God's way is right. When things seem to go wrong with me, instead of believing they're going wrong, I believe they're going right. I take on faith Romans chapter 8, verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. I've got to decide whether I shall go my way or trust blindly in the wisdom of God. If I trust blindly in God's wisdom, God promises, I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 16. God will lead me through, and when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Job chapter 23, verse 10. And God will lead me into a rich place and make me rich with treasures in heaven that can never die. But if a man wants his own way, the Lord will let him go his own way. We have to decide as Christians whether we insist on our plans and ambitions or whether we will take God's way. If we insist on our plans and ambitions, we imperil everything we have because we lack the wisdom to know how to do it. You dare not run your life. Once I got on a flight out of New York, and as we started off it was terribly windy. A man sitting next to me had flown a lot, but he didn't like the turbulence. Well, I said, when we get over the city and gain altitude, it'll level off. And it did. But when we were in that turbulence, I didn't jump up and run into the cockpit and say to the pilots, Now listen, boys, let me take over. Do you know where we'd have been if I'd have taken over? We'd have been nose down in Times Square. I didn't take over. I let the pilots have the controls. I don't mind a little turbulence when we're landing or taking off, but when we're flying up there at 17,000 feet and the fasten your seatbelt sign comes on, I say to myself, uh-oh, what are we in for now? But I have always kept my head, and I've never gone forward to the cockpit and said, now, you two fellows, get out of here. Never. And yet we're doing that to God all the time. We go to church and we pray to give our heart to the Lord, we sign a card and get converted. We join the church and get baptized. But then things get turbulent, and we run and say, Lord, let me run this thing. That's why we're so messed up in our Christian lives. We're not ready to let God run our world for us, to run our family, our business, our home, our job, our everything. The wise God always thinks of your highest good for the longest time. He always does what he does with flawless precision. 
seeing the end from the beginning, never making any mistakes, and never asking anything from you that you can't do or don't have. He never makes any unfair demands, but knows your flesh and treats you with a heart of compassion. Whatever he commands, he gives you the power to obey the command. Always. You can trust this kind of God. The difficulty with us is we don't trust God. And that's why we're in the fix that we're in. Are you going to turn everything over to the infinite love? I heard a great preacher one time tell about a man whose business had failed and someone else had bought him out. So on Friday they bought him out, and Monday he was back sitting in the executive desk. And the man who bought him out came and said, Who are you? He replied, I'm the fellow who used to own this business. Yes, you used to own it, the new owner said, but you ran it into the ground and I've taken over. Then he chased him out of there and took over. When God takes over a bankrupt human life, he says, You're in debt over your ears. I'll take over. I'll bail you out. I'll pay your debts. I'll fix you up. But I'll run your business. Then, after we get blessed Sunday night, on Monday morning we're back at the desk again, and the Holy Ghost says to us, I thought that last night in prayer you got out of that chair. Get out of there. Let me run it. God wants to run your business, your home, your wife, your husband, your children, your school, and everything. He wants to do it, and he will do it. Three Classes of People The average congregation is divided into three classes of people, the unblessed, the uncommitted, and the committed. The unblessed are those who do not believe sufficiently in the wisdom of God to trust Him to take their life over. They have never given themselves to Jesus Christ because they know it means a commitment that they are not willing to make. They may believe in God, they may believe that Christ died for their sins, but they are not ready to surrender themselves and let God run their world. They are out of the fold, not born again, unblessed. Then there's the uncommitted. They are not rebels against God. They have accepted Christ, as we say, and had some kind of spiritual experience, but they have never been willing to turn their lives over. They have not been willing to say before God, Lord, you run my life from now on. They are hanging in the middle. They are the ones that are always spiritually up and down. In the South, such people go to the altar every time a new evangelist comes around. They have a kind of a wry joke about it down there. They will say about such a man, The only way he'll get to heaven is if somebody hits him over the head with an axe just after he's converted. He's sure to be backsliding because he doesn't commit himself. He gets conversion whenever the evangelist comes around, which is two or three times a year. Then he backslides in the meantime. Of course, up north we've had better Bible teaching, so we don't do that. The uncommitted will say, I'm saved and that's it. I believe I'm saved and I'm kept. They've got all the answers, but they're uncommitted and miserable. Many students are uncommitted to their education. They play their way through school and get fairly good grades by cramming for exams. And there are Christians who play their way through life, getting old while playing at Christianity. Then there are the committed ones. They've committed themselves to the wisdom of God forever. They are satisfied that God shall have His way and that His wisdom will rule them from now on. They won't interfere and let their own heads get in the way. They begin to shine like the sun. You can always recognize them. Down at Nyack College a generation ago, a man said to me, You know, there are a few students who come here that are different. They seem to have something. The rest of us are just good folks, but these few seem to have something. You can always tell it. And you can. They're the committed ones, the ones who have gone to God and have said, in effect, My father, from this moment on, take over my life. You run it. I will not interfere. I will not complain if it's hard, get discouraged if it seems to fail, or take credit if it seems to succeed. Thine be the glory, thine be the honor. I'm committed, Lord, to thy eternal wisdom. I'm not going to dishonor thee by doubting. You can make that decision. It's just like getting married. 
Two people simply say, I do, and they are married. No matter which direction their emotions may run, they've settled something by a vow. In the same way, you can go before God and pull that ragged, uncommitted life into full commitment. God says, Wilt thou from this day forth?